Give me a minute. All right, so it seems that my, I've just stopped my sharing and I'll just uh, share my desktop again. So you should see that and I will just begin my session and if you have anything just feel free to reach out to me and just bring me up so that I will try to call the issue real time over here. Uh, hi Abhiganj. Yes. Uh, this is Varun here from 9.9 Media. Oh, that's great. I think. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, we'll start the session now. Okay. So okay. I'll just start with a slight introduction to the topic and uh, move forward from there. I hope okay. that's okay. Yeah. And let me know if you can see my screen and if you can see my slides. Sure, sure. Uh, just one sec. So, yeah, you can see your screen. Uh, everybody else is actually muted. Uh, so, if they have any questions or they have any queries, they can put them in the chat box and we can respond from there. Okay? Yeah. So, today's topic is uh, building modernized data center with Windows Server 2012 Cloud OS. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. You've taken time out uh, for busy schedule and we're really thankful for that. Uh, so we'll start with the topic first. The operating system has always been the heartbeat of IT and is now undergoing a renaissance in the new world of continuous cloud services, connected devices, and big data. Windows Server 2012 is the new buzz that revolutionizes how organization operates data center in the era of the cloud, allowing them to better meet their commitments, hence gaining tremendous efficiencies, which help translate innovation into company growth. So uh, today's speaker is Mr. Aviraj, who is a computer engineer from Mumbai. He is currently working with Microsoft Corporation India as a technology evangelist. In his present role, he is working with IT professionals across India evangelizing Microsoft technologies. Uh, in his previous role as a regional site manager, Microsoft IT, he was accountable for managing IT infrastructure of Microsoft India West region. He has concluded various tip trainings on Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, MCSE, and Sun Solaris System Administration. As an active member of IT professional communities across India, especially Mumbai User Group and Pune User Group supported by Microsoft, he's a real blogger. He's very compulsive on adding his thoughts to online blogs, forums, community, and media. And you can have a look at his technology blog on blogs.technet.com slash aviraj. So, Aviraj, before I hand over the platform to you to start the presentation, I would like to request everyone to hold their questions till the end. If you have any questions, you can post them in the chat box and we'll take them up after the presentation is done. Uh, so now, Aviraj, over to you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Forum, for that nice introduction. And uh, everyone, well, thank you very much for joining us today for this session. Uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, we make sure that this next one hour is going to be the uh, worst word of your value that I'm going to share some of the details that we have. Uh, you know, the worst value in Windows Server 2012 has the cloud OS. So, uh, this is my, this is my plan that I'm sharing with you and this is the quick agenda that I have. I will be talking about the, some of the, you know, the, the features that we have done, you know, implemented in Windows Server 2012 as the cloud OS. What is the vision behind this cloud OS as such when we were working with Windows Server 2012? And I want to give you the brief of, you know, 
what exactly Windows Server focuses on to make sure that your data center or your infrastructure is doing pretty much well in terms of the scalability, in terms of the supportability, or in terms of the performance and all. So these are some of the areas where we have actually worked a lot to make sure that you can effectively build your data center or you can effectively build your private cloud in your organization, whether it's in one location or if you're really scaling it across multiple locations. And uh, when you talk about Windows Server 2012, these are some of the key areas where we invested a lot, such as the automation, storage, networking, and virtualization. These are some of the things that we will be discussing in next one hour. Now again, I will be using slides, but my most of the content will be in the form of the demonstration. This is something that I love to do. And questions, queries, leave them up in the chat queue, and I will make sure to answer them at the end of the session over here. So our entire session is divided into these two parts. 60 minutes is the session, and remaining 15 minutes I will be taking you know, questions that you have. So about till 3.30, 3.35 I will complete my demonstrations and all. And then for next 10 minutes I will take the questions that you have. Now before we begin, I will agenda the key objectives and take away from this session. Well, Windows Server is, is, is built on the solid foundation of Windows Server 2000 in R2 that most of you have been working right now. Uh, Windows Server is 22 is designed to build your very own private cloud. And if you are thinking of, let's say, moving to this public cloud environment, going to Windows Azure, which is from Microsoft, then again you can use this particular platform to scale up and make sure that you can effectively uh, go ahead and uh, build your hybrid cloud environment with this fleet of an OS. So before we begin, we talk about we talked about this cloud OS vision. And uh, when we were talking about you know building this OS, we have been going through the series of transformational trends that have been happening in this era of our technology. Now those of you who are already there in this industry for like very long time, for at least let's say 10 or 15 years old, you must be familiar with the you know terms that we we do not have like you know the greater capacity, we don't have this scalability, we we don't have like the high bandwidth network. I mean, some of those who are still over here on this session, who would have probably used, let's say, an email running in your corporate environment, and in order to access that email, you have to probably connect to the telephone or the modem, and then do the VPN into your organization, and then try to access the email. Things pretty much changed in last few years eventually over here. And uh, what we see over here right now is that there are a lot of changes happen in, in this era of modern computing. One of the things that we also see over here is that we have we have started seeing the various trends. So as you can see these days, we talk about this social as one of the important trends. So we have the Twitter, Facebook, that's for my consumers. And for my enterprise users, they have, let's say, LinkedIn. They have Yammer as the website where they go and communicate. Now we have the data explosion. We have like everybody, every organization has brought a lot of data to Jenkins, and every now and then they build tons and tons of data that they, sh that they keep in their package. But what we are now seeing in opportunity is if I can leverage the data that I had, I can probably kind of, you know, make sure and, you know, build some analytics, build you know, some business intelligence out of that and make sure to get some predictions or get some value out of the data. We call this the big data is the evolution. And uh, then we are starting this buzz as the consumerization of IT. Well, the consumerization of IT is pretty much a simple term, but the idea is very simple that if I am a user and if I am working at an organization, make sure that I should be able to bring my own devices in my organization. And then again, you should have the infrastructure to, you know, manage that. I cannot just get my non domain job machine and get, try to work it in my corporate computer, which is having no antivirus or which is not having any patches or no firewall configured. So that is something that we have worked, you know, we have been talking about this in the last few years. And of course, if you are aware about you know, the technical industry for like last few years, cloud computing is the buzzword. We have we have Windows Azure, we have Amazon, we have uh, many other forms of the public cloud environment where you actually go and start using your services effectively immediately. But at the heart of that lies is the power, which is the compute storage and networking. I often call them the resources, and these resources are the key components of empowering any organization or any data center that you effectively going to use every now and then. And that's what our focus is when we are building this OS. Now when we talk about this vision for my cloud, you know, cloud OS, 
we have been thinking about deep strains and we were making sure that make sure that if my customers are going to build let's say this particular infrastructure they should be get the value out of their hardware effectively now we have been seeing virtualization which was there for very long time and uh, what virtualization did effectively is virtualization started allowing us to kind of do the consolidation over here and uh, what is the meaning of that consolidation well it's pretty step over that if i'm kind of doing my data center virtualization i'm saving a lot in terms of the you know the cost in terms of the space in terms of the storage so these are some of the things that we have started to see with the help of you know the virtualization and at the same time when we were you know in this you know data center kind of a concept we were thinking all right that's the good idea of let's say of building a private cloud that you are actually go virtualize build a private cloud and start running your application and all but how do you get to the private cloud stage over there because if you talk about this you know bare virtualization you don't get those many attributes that you get in a public cloud so yes you cannot spin one vm with you know quickly if you have some more workload you cannot kind of you know scale up and scale down effectively you cannot just do the charging based upon the usage But these are some of the areas that we wanted to fix. Hello. The apps part. We have mobile devices, we have iPads, Android, Windows phones, and all. And we wanted to make sure that how do we scale in such a way that we should be able to control those devices as well. If somebody who is willing to carry his mobile device, I should be not only able to manage him, but also his kind of apps as well. So that is something that we have been figuring out with this particular OS. At the same time, we are also making sure that how to unlock the insights on the data that we just talked about, the big data, the BI, the intelligence, the analytics, and all. And lastly, we need to empower the people-centric IT. So my today's discussion is focusing only upon this point, which is the transforming our data center and how you can effectively use this as a cloud over switch to make sure that you can effectively build the data center in your organization, which is not only kind of just uh, virtualized or consolidated. But it's completely scalable environment. Now, when I say it's a scalable environment, it means that you can actually go ahead and uh, build your environment effectively with all the cloud attributes that we have been talking or we have been hearing every now and then on various websites. So that is the idea behind it. And at Microsoft, when you say the cloud OS, well, it's Windows. Windows is our platform that we generally uh, talk about. That's our client platform. That's our server platform. And Windows is also there in Azure. And we talk about for the server workload. Well, if you see, we have two areas where we can actually talk about this. And uh, in public cloud environment, we have Windows Azure, and uh, in the private cloud environment, we have Windows Server 2012 as the cloud platform in our organization. So that is something that we have right now where we can actually leverage my platform effectively uh, for building a private cloud. At the same time, if you want to let's say manage the whole infrastructure, we have let's say Windows System Center 2012 as the management suite, and you can use the same database in the cloud, which is public cloud or a private cloud, or you can still use Visual Studio for development. Specifically, talking about this Microsoft Private Cloud story, because the Private Cloud story is all built upon your data center piece, which is Windows Server 2012, and uh, if you try to use this particular, you know, this uh, platform. You will eventually realize that when we were building this particular two components, which are uh, Windows Server 2012 and the System Center components, the key idea of Microsoft Private Cloud are the four things. It's all about apps. Whenever you build your infrastructure or the data center, the first idea is that you build this infrastructure to make sure that you can run something. And that something means your Adobe application, your internal application, your web application, or some sort of a workload. That is the key essence in in this particular release of an an OS and we wanted to target that a cross platform for metro we make sure that we not only support the microsoft virtualization but we also support the uh, uh, the non microsoft workload as well if you are using system center a uh, foundation for the future whenever we are releasing the new platform such as windows server 2012 in your data center you start leveraging all those benefits such as networking enhancement virtualization enhancement storage management automation scalability all that you get and lastly when you say on to your terms you can make sure that if you want to build let's say a hybrid cloud environment you can do that if you want to stick to the on prem architecture you can do that so pretty much you get the flexibility in your organization to completely manage and choose the environment the way you want so that is the 
key idea of leveraging Windows Server 2012. And now one of the reasons that we say that this is cloud OS is with one reason because of this is if you are aware that when you, whenever I say that I have a cloud computing in my organization, so what exactly is this cloud computing environment? Well, pretty much whenever you have these four attributes in your organization provided by, you know, kind of your uh, service provider, we say that you have a cloud computing environment. Now, obviously, these particular attributes such as my pooling of resources that is getting more hardware, hardware without any downtime, self-service going to kind of a web portal and requesting for specific, you know, uh, specific resources such as virtual machine or any uh, website and something like the idea of using the self-service that has to be there. Effectively, if you want to, let's say, scale up and scale down, such as if your website right now has got 5,000 users, but tomorrow if we have like about 10 number of, uh, you know, users, then how do you do that? So, all that is done with the, with the help of this particular uh, uh, attribute which is called as Elasticity. And lastly, if you want to let's say manage your infrastructure, you should be effectively go ahead and should be able to uh, build and manage and you should be able to charge your end users based upon how much is the workload that you have in your organization and how much you are consuming. That is something was not possible earlier and that's what we were actually trying to build with the help of this particular release in this environment. And with the private cloud, you get more control over here. So this is pretty much the essence of Microsoft Private Cloud. You start off with a self-service portal. You have a service model where you have some sort of a service startup over there. And uh, we have this particular infrastructure built with the help of Windows Server and System Center at the back end. Windows Server being my foundation, which is what we were discussing today. And in the next session that we have, we will be focusing upon the remaining management stack, which we have covered up in this particular release. So that is the... Uh, idea that we are actually planning to do with this particular series of the webcast. Now, talking about this foundation piece of Windows Server 2012, like Windows Server 2012 is having these four key pillars where we have kind of built this complete cloud OS in my organization, starting with manageability. I do have an ability to manage my entire organization with the help of my one particular server management tool, which is Server Manager. And if you're familiar with Windows Server 2008 R2, we have many more tools available that you can use to do the management of your OS. Subsequently, we have some enough made for the storage, in the networking, and in the virtualization that we are going to see in a minute. Now, when you talk about this uh, manageability aspect of my data center, there are a lot of things which are involved over here. The broader coverage, I have, I have to have more integrity, I have to make sure that I should be able to perform several tasks effectively without spending much time. It should be resilient. In case something happens, I should be able to go back and fix it immediately and should be able to give me the, you know, effective performance whenever I'm doing certain tasks. So, we have introduced PowerShell 3.0, which is the new feature, or I would say the updated feature in Windows Server 2012. This is our key component for building my entire data center and performing all of my automation. You can pretty much automate almost any task in your data center that you can think of doing it by a GUI uh, with the public PowerShell 3.0 command line tool, which is a scripting tool. The PowerShell 3.0 is a new scripting tool. It's got a lot of features. It's got more than 2,400 command lines in this particular release. And day by day, there are more number of command lines getting added over here. I can do a lot many things with PowerShell in terms of resiliency. I can have this session configuration. I can, so when I say session configuration means I can connect to multiple servers from the same PowerShell environment to make sure that if I have to run some specific script on 100 servers, I can be, you know, I can do that effectively and I should be able to, you know, perform that task without worrying about the performance or without worrying about the, you know, configuration piece at all. The more integrated experience will give me in terms of I can use the same script with a small modification, I can use it over there. And effectively, I can use a lot of announcements which are made in PowerShell such as IntelliSense, which I'm going to demonstrate in, in this environment over here. So, like I said, there are several command lists available with this release. We have every feature in an OS controlled by a PowerShell such as the networking, the, the management, the storage management, the software deployment, your package deployment, and almost anything and everything that you can think of. 
One of my favorite features with this release is, is the feature called as PowerShell Web Access. So what it means in, in, in simple world, where like you have remote desktop gateway in your organization and let's say if you set up certain virtual machines in your organization, you typically try to connect to the remote environment and then you actually go ahead and try to access the VMs over the internet. This is exactly similar. What I have done is I have configured my PowerShell Web Access server in my corporate network on the DMZ. And I'm using any browser of any, you know, any tablet, which is an Android, or I, I, iOS, iPad, or any Windows phone, or any Windows 8 PC, Windows 7 PC. I can just open up a web link, and I get this kind of a powerful session on my environment, which I can use it to manage my environment. So, with this, let's quick, quickly see the demonstration of my powerful based environment. Let me quickly log into my remote environment. Uh, this is where I'm actually storing all of my configuration. So let me just connect in a minute. So it is connecting to my remote environment where I have configured all of my uh, data over here and that's what I'm logging it. My corporate credential in my organization. And uh, we should be able to see my screen in a minute or so. Here it is. So, first of all, let me quickly introduce my environment to you all. So, I have few virtual machines that I'm running on this server. I have few VMs that I'm running. I have a Node 1 and Node 2 for a cluster. I have a VM server, VM server, which has got sort of Node installed. This ADBA is my uh, Active Directory machine. This one is my AD. This one is my client. Uh, these two are my cluster nodes. These, these are my additional servers that I have configured and this VM server is my server where I have configured few roles. So starting with the PowerShell based enhancements that I was talking to you about in this release. So uh, this is my Windows Server 2012 based environment and first time when I log in this is how my Windows Server 2012 start screen looks like. So this is my, that my desktop looks like. Now when I launch Windows Server, because Windows Server 2012 is based upon the foundation of a Windows Server 2008 R2, that means the development of Windows Server and the Windows 8 is together. It means that if I show you this version number, it has exactly the same version that you will see in Windows 8. And it's 6.2 build 9200. And that's exactly the reason they, sh they share the same component, the client and server. You will still see that we have a trust screen over here and we have the desktop over here. So that's how it is designed. So that's what my a uh, people centric ID, the feature I was talking to you about, it's towards that direction. So whenever I launch, whenever I launch my server for the first time, I will see that I will have a, 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 a server manager launch at the start of my machine. And uh, this is my component where I'm going to manage all of my environment over here. So when I first time launch a server, I will see that I can do some quick configuration tasks over here. I can configure this local server or I can configure the roles, features, and I can add multiple servers. Now one of the biggest features of this release is that when I'm actually using server manager, I can add multiple servers over here so that I can do multi-server management over here effectively. Now by default when you launch a server, let me hide this, you will see that it will show me that how many servers that I've added over here. So right now I just have one server and based upon the servers that I've added over here, it will show me the list of roles that I've installed. So if I have to add more oh. servers over here, I will say manage. In the right corner that I'm clicking over here, say add roles, sorry, add servers over here. And I will say fine now. And based on my DNS, it will be certain machine that I have in my organization. So let me quickly add few more servers over here. And the moment I do that, we should be able to see that it will go and start to query the IP address and status and all. And based upon that, I will see that certain roles will be added over here real time based upon the roles that I have added over here. Now there's some issue over here because of some IT configuration. I'm not able to query this over here. But if I try to do the same thing over here in my just a remote environment, I should be able to see that. Now here it is. Whenever I add many servers, my roles and server groups will show me that how many roles that I have installed in my organization with including of all the servers. So I have a total of six roles installed. I have one server group and I have a total of four servers added. And each server will have its status. I can click on these specific activities over here. 
Say like I can think of manability, I can think of manageability, email, services to start or stop any service, to see performance, or to see the best practices analysis over here. And if you see some, you see some red color over there. It means that something is not right over there. So this gives me a clear indication kind of a dashboard that what's good and what's bad, what's happening with my environment. And I can quickly see the number of servers on which this role is installed. So that my final storage service is installed on the four machines, but my remaining roles have been installed only on the one machine here only. So let me go to a local server, and this is where I will configure all of my a local configuration such as I can do change a work group, change a name, I can configure the remote management, firewall, and mix teaming is supported in this OS and subsequent configuration of roles and features over here. And then I can quickly create let's say a new group over here. So if I create a new group called as let's say cluster, I will just build a new group called as cluster and I can then probably add these two nodes over there and it will quickly create a group over here. And if I click on a cluster, I should be able to see those two machines which I've just added with this release over here. So this is pretty much the experience I get with the help of a server manager. Now if you ask me about the scale, I can show you that I have one more environment configured which is in my remote uh, Bangalore based location which is this and opening it up. In this environment, if I open up my server manager, here if you see that I have about few servers added up over here. Now I have about like more than 50 servers are added over here, so there are 54 servers. And if you see, if I click on a dashboard, it shows me that total of 16 roles have been installed in the in your 54 servers across. And I can see the status of all the servers with one click. So that there is some issue with my hyper-V BPA results, I can see that. There are a couple of DNA servers that I have in my organization. There are 27 servers where I have configured my IIS. So I'm using web server a lot. And subsequently it gives me a clear picture of any server in one go whenever I'm connecting. Now here's the, here's the beautiful part about this management. Now whenever I want to access any remote machine, typically what you have to do with the help of 2008 R2, you have to manually RTP into the server and make sure to connect it. Well not at all in this case. Here what I can do is I can just right click on the server and it is smart enough to understand that the which roles are installed on that server, so it's context aware. It will understand that there is a DC install, so it will give me the DC lag over here and subsequent exe that I can do as a part of my RSAT tools over here. So if I want to let's say open up a power shell on this particular computer, I can just do it from this click. I can click on this window power shell and it will actually open the power shell console or the power shell session of that machine from this machine here, from here only. So if I say host name, it will give me the host name, I can see get type command called as get hyphen command and it should be able to give me all the commands effectively over here. So let me see change the font size so you should be able to see that effectively. And if I just uh, do this, it should be able to show me all the commands which are there on this particular machine. Time. There it is. All these commands are actually it's showing me from that particular system. So just uh, right. So I'm here on this machine. Let me just quickly exit. So the idea is that I can pretty much open up any power shell and perform any task over here. One of the new features that we also done with this release for simplicity is that. If, I, if I'm going to let's say install, let's say multiple roles, now often I need to install roles and features on many of my machines. What happens typically is that whenever I open this wizard, let's say to add a new role, I can do either role-based installation or I can configure my remote desktop services-based installation over here for my VDI. So I will just come over here and say next. And uh, I'm going to have to choose the server that I want to install the role. So this is my VMM server over here. I will say next. And by the way, I can also deploy the role and feature directly on a VHD file from the template itself. Now the one good thing over here is, I'm going to install a, a role, which is a server role, and I'll let's say if I click Hyper-V over here and hit Next, or let me give you some error, let me just choose some other role such as, let's say DNS server, and if I let's say Add Features, Click on continue, click on next, 
and then I can choose a feature. Now the beauty over here is that I can choose rows and features in one wizard, which was not possible earlier. So that's the beauty over here. And then subsequently I will install the specific role or, role or feature based configuration and I will just install it to install the old. One of the benefits that I have also read over here is that I can export this configuration in the form of an XML file. So if I save it on a desktop, it will save all this configuration as an XML file. And the beauty is that I can actually use this PowerShell command called as install hyphen Windows features space hyphen configuration path and provide this XML file. And what an XML file contains is the specific details about the roles and features that I have installed. So if I have to install the same role or feature or 100 servers or 200 servers, I can just pass in the same parameter with the power chain and it will make sure that features on this machine without needing to log in over there. And that's the beauty of this server manager. So in terms of the management, server manager is one tool which, which has got a lot of new enhancements for manageability. Coming up to my PowerShell based environment, so let me launch PowerShell. So this is my PowerShell. I'm not sure how many here aware about the PowerShell, but the PowerShell is the great tool wherein you can actually type a lot of command gates, you can use, use it to script like a lot of you know, activities, a lot of functions, a lot of reusable stuff that you can do over here. So the first command you should type is get hyphen command. And this command will give you all the available commands on that system that you can make use of. So there are so many command gates available that, that it, it's quite a lot. And just to see how many commands do I have, I will just type this command called as get hyphen command and I will use the pipe operator to pass on another command that says measure object. And it will give me that there are a total of about 1600 command gates that are available on this machine. Now, as and when, when I install multiple rules, there will be more command gates available. Like I said, we have more than 2,200 command gates available. And I can have various modules as well. So I can use this get module command to see how many modules do I have. And uh, if I have to, let's say, find specific module, I can just type this command called as show hyphen command. And it will give me all the available modules that I have in my system. So each module basically contains specific command gates, such as I have some commands for Active Directory, like these many commands. And uh, I have commands for my DNS, DSTP, ISCSI, networking, and my security, my PowerShell, secure goods management. For everything I can make use of this PowerShell-based environment to perform several tasks over here. Now, one of the things that we also have with the PowerShell is that we have something called as PowerShell Integrated, integrated Scripting Environment. This one tool basically allows me to perform various tasks from this location. So what I can do over here, if I have, let's say, a PS1 file, I can perform the task over here. So let me just quickly show you on my host machine. I have few PowerShell commandlets available over here. Let me launch PowerShell Integrated, integrated Scripting Environment. PowerShell ISE is what we call. And uh, when I launch that, let me quickly open up one file which has got some PowerShell commands available. I'll just select this. And I have some PowerShell scripts over here for various tasks over here. And if I choose this option, such as my domain controller deployment, these are the commands. And the beauty is that I can you know, choose only certain area to execute by pressing, let's say, F5 as a full script or F8 as the selected part. Or I can just run universe you know, F5 and run the full script over here. And uh, one of the things that I can do with this release is that I get something called as IntelliSense. Now, what is IntelliSense? Like developers, when they're developing the software, they get some hints when they type something. Similarly, when I'm just typing get hyphen, I will get a list of all the available commands that I can make use of. And I can type this command called as vn, and I can provide, you know, the dash, which will give me again a pipe operator. So if I say that, I want to find a list of all the VMs and the name should be WS star. So whenever I run this command, it will give me the list of all the VMs which start with WS and start with my wildcard character. So if I'm typing, let's say, node, it will give me that I have two nodes which are running on this machine. So intelligence is pretty powerful which will give you some information about your organization 
and you can effectively do the automation with the help of opening the multiple sessions of a power cell into the remote environment. So one of the features I want to show you again in terms of the manageability is how do you manage your remote environment over the internet. So what I have configured over here is that I have this particular VM called as VMM Server 20, VMM, uh, VM Server over here. And uh, let me, I was just installing the role, let me just complete that installation. That's it. I have installed a feature called as PowerShell Web Access and what I have done is I have configured this PowerShell Web Access application over here and I have provided certain users access to this TFWA Web Access which is my website. And what it does exactly is that it basically starts my web server over here and what I can do then is that I can just come to my any of my internet based client and I can just open up the web browser and I will visit this particular website called as that particular VM server and I'll type this command called as uh, provide this application name as PSWA. And now of course I can expose this over an internet with the help of an SSL certificate. I am not done that but I'm just doing this internally just to demonstrate that. So when I open this website it will give me this kind of my web page interface saying that welcome to Windows PowerShell Web Access and I need to provide my credentials. So let me provide my administrative credentials over here and let me provide my password. And here I want to connect using my computer name as a you know connection type. I'm going to give a computer name which is VM server. And if I want I can provide some additional details as well as the gateway or something like that. Here I will say sign in. And what it, what it will eventually do is it will connect to that VM, VM server which is my server running 2012. And it will validate that if the user has got a valid credentials over there. And based upon my server state, whether it's on or off, it will give me my PowerShell console over here. So let's see the status of my server, the server is on. And uh, let me just come back to my this machine and here you go. This is my PowerShell based environment. And now I'm actually running this command directly on my VM server based machine. It means I'm sitting in front of that. I can perform the task like let's say get command AD. So even if I have to let's say perform some tasks on that machine for active directory management such as get AD user, AD management or anything that I can think of, I can just do that real time with the help of this command called get command. So whatever commands that you are seeing over here, you can run those commands directly from the browser which will be executed on that machine so with the help of this command called get command. So whatever commands that you are seeing over here, you can run those commands directly from the browser which will be executed on this machine. So this is a beautiful tool for my IT administrator that they can use of. So these are some of the uh, nifty management enhancements that we have done with this release with the help of PowerShell based modules over here with this release. Now coming up we will talk about the next piece which is my storage. Now of course that PowerShell is very useful for database automation, I mean my data automation in my organization management of my data center effectively. But when it comes to my storage, we were looking for some good solution. And we have just made it with this shape of storage. So the idea is that we have to make sure that so if something happens to my underneath storage, it should not affect to my application. It should kind of self-heal and it should provide a you know a kind of a resiliency to my application. I need to have some local solution. Of course, I, I can have this fiber channel or I can have this fan storage and all. But what if I can use something like the JVOD or the standard SSD disk and if I can build some sort of a scalable storage? Well, nothing like it. That's for something something that we were thinking of. And then we built up this particular storage based announcements over here. And we have like several features introduced with this release, such as the SME transfer and failover, test server updating, file system announcement. SMB multi-channel to make use of all of the network cards in your organization, online backup and highly scalable environment. So at the begin to begin with we have introduced a new file system called as RDFS, Resilient File System. This is designed to make sure that it can recover your data corruption pretty fast effectively. You will never have to run a check disk ever on the disk because it's completely redesigned are resilient against the power failure outages. Even if you have something going wrong, it will make sure that the data is integrated or the data integrity is kept as is even if there is some issue with the help of the power failure and stuff like that. Next up is we have something called as the SME transfer failover. 
So you can let's say having this highly available or highly scalable speed over and if it's a SMB file share, in case during the normal operation I should be able to start working, but in case my server goes down, all the connections to the storage are channeled to the second server, making sure that my my transfer and failure happens out of the box and my clients are still accessing my server without any problem or my file share. One of the new features that we also work with this release is to make sure that how do we reduce the number of reboot cycles. Now of course when we release any update or any branch in an organization, a lot of my systems including clusters, nodes, they try to get that update and they make sure that all of them installed and they end up pretty much up to date. But the challenge over is that if, if my servers receive an update, they may pretty much restart in any point in time, right? We don't have a control over there. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that at any point in time, only one server, one node in a cluster should be updated and one by one my workload should be migrated effectively without affecting my my entire workload and, and things like that. So that's the beauty of this feature called a cluster aware updating. At the same time, we have now introduced the ISV as a part of the OS itself. As you are aware, last to last year we released ISV as a free software and now it has made its debut in the OS itself. So ISV is part of your Windows Server 2012. So you can actually use the ISCSI target, ISCSI initiator is anywhere part of the OS which you can actually create, connect and again it's completely supported by PowerShell based environment. We now have this NFS which is a network file server, 4.1 support which gives you the best support for your NFS based workload in your organization. One of the things that we also done with this release is that you will now have a support for Windows Azure. If you are using Windows Server 2012 as the data center component in your organization, you can use to back up your data such as your system state, server backup and all in Windows Azure effectively. So you can actually sign up for that, you can actually register it one time and you can actually store your data in Azure which is public cloud and you can actually use the different clouds and you can record your data effectively with the help of these tools available in your organization. So very quickly just see the demonstration of how my storage looks like. So I have some demonstration to show you over here on my disk machine. So first of all, I have few disks configured on this particular machine over here. So if I am coming up to my disk machine and if I am, if you see, first of all for my storage, this is a new feature. I have this new interface where I can manage my storage. And if I keep on my, so my ISV, here you will see that it's pretty straightforward for me to create ISCV. All I need to do is just, you know, kind of create a new virtual hard disk over here, which I have created already. I need to just select next, and I'll have to give a name as disk2 over here, which will, which will be created in my disk particular folder over here. I'm just giving 5G for the demo purpose. I can use an existing ISCV target, or I can create a new ISCV target with, with few clicks over here, and I will say create. Now once I'm done with this, this basically creates a new virtual disk for my ISCSI effective immediately over here. And uh, once it is completed, I should be able to see the disk available in my particular area over here. Now what I can also do is I can just go and see the properties of that over here, which will give me the null number and some description over here. And here, I can actually create the new target over here. And when I show you, I can, we can see the target over here. And then I can see that who, who all are my initiators. I have a cluster node 1 and 2 are the initiators. And I can quickly add more initiators over here without spending any more time. So it's pretty straightforward that I can be part of my OS over here. Now storage pool. Now when I'm talking about this storage pool, storage pool is the new feature introduced in Windows Server 2012. So what exactly does it do? Well, I can show you quickly in, in this example. So, here I will be having these multiple disks over here. So let me just select this uh, square over here. So let me just maximize that. So I have this multiple disk available over here, which is of like different different sizes. Now these are my physical disks available in my organization. It could be one TB, it could be two TB, it could be three TB and all. But they are assorted, right? They are not kind of a single volume, so they are completely mixed uh, disks that are connected. What my Windows Server will provide me, it will provide me kind of an abstraction on top of it. What I will do is I will now create from this physical disk a fresh virtual disk which is 
made up of, let's say, three or four disks over here. So I will have one disk which is made up of this three disks over here. And I will also create another disk over here which will be made up of these two actual physical disks over here. So this will be my new virtual disk. This will be my new virtual disk. And then on top of this disk, I am going to create this small, small volume like I do or create a lens like I do create on my actual disk over here. So the beauty here is that you no longer have to worry about this underneath hardware. Even if there is a failure of any hardware, this is not impacted. My this particular layer which is provided by my Windows Server 2012, it takes care of this layer. So this layer is my storage spaces layer. So what we require is basically this empty hard disk over here. Now if I just uh, come back to my demonstration again, you will now clear, get an idea. So these are the physical disks that are connected to my machine right now, which are this disk. Now, before I create a volume and ex you know, expose it to my environment, I need to first create a new storage space over here. So how do I do that? I will create a new storage pool first, and here I will say that I have to create a new storage pool, and I will say that this is my dev pool because this is for my developers. I will say next over here. I will choose how many disks do I want. I will say I want to add at least three disks right now. Now again, the same rules that you do when you do a kind of a dynamic disk kind of a partitioning, such as if you want mirroring, you should have at least two. If you want parity, you should you need to have at least three disks in your environment. So I will just create kind of a storage pool over here. Now the storage pool means, okay, let's come back over here. So storage pool means this. This is what we create as a storage pool, which is made up of the disk. disk. We call this the storage pool. Now once it is created, the pool of three disks, I will now going to create a new virtual disk, which is the disk that we just created here from the three disks over here. So let me say new. I will say that I want to create a new disk, which is v disk you know, 01. I will say next. And I will say that I want to create a simple mirror parity. I will say I want to create a simple mirror so that I can use all the space. Now, interesting piece. The beauty of this solution is that even if, let's say, you have, let's say, a 6 TB over here on this great disk as a total capacity, you can still create, let's say, a 10 or a 20 TB capacity over here on this particular environment. So, what it means that, as you can see that, I do have the capacity of only 6 TB over here. But still, I can just go ahead and say that I want to do the thin provisioning, means the dynamically expanding volume. And I will say that I want to create a 10 TB virtual disk on top of it. And I will say create. So it means that actually physically I have the three disks which is made up of 6.5 TB, but I have built a new virtual disk which will appear as a new disk to my OS. And now I am going to create a new volume over here on that. And let me go ahead and create a volume of let's say, I will say next as a 5 TB and I am going to call this as a T drive. Hit next, I can choose the new file system which is my REFS. Again some things that you can use shorter names like 8.3 on the REFS partition. Hit next. So once it is completed, it happens pretty fast and it's done. So I can also create, let's say, new volume over here, or I can actually come over here and say, I want to create a new, I got this, this over here, let me just come in volume and show you the volumes. So here it is. I should be able to see my volumes over here, so these are the volumes over here. And if I go to my storage pools, I can just come over here, I will just quickly show you that I have this configuration done over here. And it will show me the health, all the details of my environment over here. So similarly, what I can do is I can just right click on this particular, you know, storage pool that I've just configured, and I can every time add more disk as I'm trying to see that my disk is going to fill it out. So I can just do that real time over here, and uh, uh, once I see the disk that I have, so it, will, it should be showing me my disk which is created. And I can right click and say create a new volume now and I want to create one more volume of 5 TB because I do have the 5 TB space over here and I can just call it F drive, this time I'm going to keep as NTFS and say next, next and by the way when I'm using NTFS I can also use the data deduplication. So my Windows Server 2012 offers built-in data deduplication on my every volume. If you want you can enable that. 
and also you can schedule it the way you want it. And yes, everything is controlled by PowerShell as well. So if you type this command called as get command and type this command called as dedupe, well, there are these commands available for data deduplication, which is enable dedupe, volume dedupe, job, and things like that. So again, it's all configured over here. And once that is completed, if you see, I can just come to explore and you should be able to see that I just have created two new volumes, 5 TV each, which are visible as the disk on my computer. So that is the beauty of storage spaces in this environment. And I can effectively use this to create multiple file shares, SMB shares, and all from this environment. So that's the beauty of how I can effectively use my underneath infrastructure to build such kind of an integration in my organization. All right, coming up to the next part of the presentation, let's talk about the networking. Well, we have a lot of announcements we made in the networking as well. We have the NIC TV, which is fully supported out of the box in the server. We have QoS, which means you can do the bandwidth or the throttling or you can monitor the performance. You can have a new feature called as DHCP Fairwall. So you can have multiple DHCP servers in your organization and you also have SMB multi-channel. It means that uh, you can actually have more number of transfer rates on multiple network cards. Start with NIC teaming. This is NIC teaming. The NIC teaming means that I can combine a few 32 adapters together and I can do this with the PowerShell or I, can, or I can do this with the server GUI and even if in case of any NIC phase, there is no impact on my data transfer because I am actually having this NIC team so that it will work effectively. SMB, trans, SMB multi-channel. So if I have, let's say, a server in it, if I have a client and if I have a copy of file, and if both of them have this, you know, multi-channel NIC card, I can effectively use it to transfer the data from both the network cards to make use of the maximum possible available bandwidth to copy the data at very fast speed. Another feature that I was talking to you about is DHCP failover. I can add a new DHCP server in my organization, and it will work as a kind of an hot trackable failover or in the partnership mode it will work. So it could be a hot standby or it could be a load sharing failover DHCP on my organization that I can do. I can also do this effective quality of a service that's very essential in an organization by making use of these uh, features called as DCB or the ECO that I can do the bandwidth management using Hyper-V in my organization. So very quickly let's see the quick demo of uh, my network adapter. So if I, let's say, come to my servers over here, I have some remote servers over here, and if I, let's say, launch, it's going a bit slow. So if I just come over here on this particular node, which is a node 6 over here, if I go to dashboard, uh, if I go, sorry, if I go to my local server, my server manager, go up, you will see that I have something called as NIC teaming. I can click on to it and to enable NIC teaming and based upon the how many hardware do I have, I can enable the NIC teaming. So here I can create a new team and I can call the team as my P NIC team over here and then I can choose the various physical adapters that I have on my environment and I can actually have either a switch dependent or a kind of a static teaming or an independent or a let me type of a NIC. If it's a load balancing one, I can choose whether it should be used for my Hyper-V port or for an address hash. And I can also use these standby adapters as well. Means if I don't want active active, but if I want active passive, I can do that as well. So it's all supported out of the box with this release of Windows Server 2012. So that's the feature called as uh, network teaming over there. At the same time, if I have to let's say use a multiple DHCP server, so I would like to show you this on my environment. So here, I have a DHCP server configured on this machine over here with one scope on my domain controller which is dc.msfc.com. Now here is a scope configured and if you see the lease, there are about few machines which are actually going to take this lease right now, reservations and all. Uh, if I go to my VM server which is part of the same configuration, the minimum requirement for a DHCP failover is that you need to install the DHCP role over here. I have already installed a DHCP role. I uh, will just complete the remaining configuration to make this DHCP as the highly available server over here. So I'll just say next and complete my basic DHCP configuration. So my service is start. So if I just open up my DHCP, and let me quickly check and see the status over here. And yes, my DHCP is on. But if you see, there is no scope over here configured. So what I will do right now is that I will just go back to my first DC over here. 
ఆయన అది రక్కి పొంది హై బీవీ మార్కే నాట్ కన్సిడర్ ఫీల్ ఓవర్ ఇట్ విల్ నాట్ మల్టిపుల్ టూల్స్ ఆఫ్ స్కోప్ ఇట్ కుడ్ బి మల్టిపుల్ స్కోప్ అస్ వెల్ అండ్ ఇఫ్ యు నౌ ఆఫ్ మీ ఏ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ సర్వర్ ఐ విల్ సే యాడ్ ఏ సర్వర్ ఐ విల్ కాల్ ఇట్ యాజ్ ఏ విఎన్ సర్వర్ ఓవర్ హియర్ సో లెట్ మీ జస్ట్ కాల్ ఇట్ గివ్ ఇట్ ఏ విఎన్ సర్వర్ ఓకే ఐ విల్ క్లిక్ ఓకే ఇట్ యాక్చువల్లీ చెక్ దట్ ఇన్ ద విఎన్ సర్వర్ మెషిన్ డస్ హావ్ ద డిఎస్సిపి రన్నింగ్ డిఎస్సిపి సర్వీస్ రన్నింగ్ ఆర్ నాట్ ఇఫ్ యస్ డోన్ నో లెట్ యు గివ్ మీ ద నెక్స్ట్ స్క్రీన్ otherwise it will give me an error saying that it's not there because i can see this screen it means that it has rejected that it has that, that machine has got the dcp command running now i can choose that either in a load balance mode or a hot standby mode in a load balance mode it will take 50 50 in a hot standby mode if hot goes down the second server will keep the all the history backup and connect it i will disable the message authentication for timing and say next and say finish and as you can see we will start talking to each other and it will be reflecting and when i refresh it it should be done so now let me just go back to my other particular machine and see if it has got the updated data or not so now as you can see let me just try to refresh it and as you can see the scope that i'm just showing you on my first machine is now reflected over here this is the meaning of my dcp failover so that's how it works if i click on a failover if i see the failover properties it should show me that this is configured in a failover with this partnership name and it's in a load balance mode so that's how my some of the small small networking announcements are making sure i can effectively make use of the hardware really effectively on my server infrastructure over here so coming back to my presentation to cover up this last part which is the virtualization so virtualization is the key aspect of my entire organization so actually i'm just making a small quick correction over here this is actually the 8x improvement in my entire environment so on the host compared to 2012 i now support the 320 logical cpus on a physical box if i have to use that machine for virtualization i can allot up to 4 tb memory on a physical box compared to 1 tb and i can have up to 2048 cpus on the vcpu if you talk about the vm scale we were supporting up to 4 cpus per virtual machine but now we support up to 64 virtual machines per uh, 64 vcpus per virtual machine means you can pretty much run almost any workload that you can think of in a virtual environment i can allot up to 1 tb memory on my virtual machine and i can run up to 1024 vms on our node and for a clustering i can build a massive 16 node cluster which can run almost 8000 vms without any problem based on the scale so these are some of the announcements that we have done over here some small small announcements because we have heard from the customers that there are some areas or there are some power failures which could cause corruption of my vhd file so we work on that as well so if you see now my vhd vhd file format supports up to 64 tb of our storage in a vm environment compared to 2 v 2 tb in a vhd format and it is which is a power failure resiliency support for a 4 tb disk sector for greater performance over there on my organization it supports the numa which is a non uniform memory access that is if i have let's say lot of memory and lot of cpu I will make a group of a CPU and a memory and I call them a node. So there's a new one node 1, new one node 2 and many more which will give me the more performance on my environment. And I can also connect a fiber channel adapter to my VM directly with the help of a worldwide name set in my environment. So that's something that we have added over here. So quickly take a look at that in a moment. So some of the announcements we made with this release are also in terms of is this is my machine and this is my remote environment and let me just close that over here. So right now I am connected to this particular virtual machine which is called as, uh, uh, let me just connect it over here. Let's, let's give it a minute and uh, let me just uh, maximize that. Yeah. So on my remote environment I have two networks that I want to show you. I have two network connected machines, host 6 and host 7. These are my physical servers. Both of them have Hyper-V configured. And the beauty is that, if I open up to my Hyper-V 6 over here, let me open up my server manager over here, Hyper-V manager over here. Let me 
Close that. Yeah. So this is my Hyper-V console that it looks like. Now pretty much it looks exactly similar. What has changed is now we call it a virtual switch manager. So there are some announcements we made with the, with this release. Now what are those announcements? Well, first of all, uh, whenever let's say I am let's say configuring a new VM, I just try to make sure the properties over here in the setting of that VM. The VM will now have a network and some additional announcements for my network. So that, uh, the hard drive simulation, the advanced features such as the DHCP guard, the router guard, port mirroring if you want to do the port mirroring, and even the guest level leak teaming support for my OS level as well provided over here. If I open up and show you my, let's say, settings again and show you the processor over here, well my processor now supports the NUMA. So here I can see this NUMA configuration that I can do over here, the hardware topology. My Hyper-V does it for me but you can also override and do it over here. And every time you want to let's say add a new, let's say scale up the entire virtual CPUs, I can just come over here and just add them on just like that. So I can add like this up to 64 VCUs to my VM and I can pretty much add up to 64,000 uh, lot of memory to my uh, machine on this environment. I also have a virtual SAN manager which I can use to configure a virtual fiber channel SAN over here. And uh, one of the things that we did with this release is that whenever you create a network switch, we now call this a network switch, you can actually extend the virtual switch. You can add extensions over here so that you can do the packet capturing, you can do the filtering, you can add you know, use kind of an Cisco Nexus 1000 virtual switch to the integration. We have Fi9, we have OpenFlow, we have Maxflow integration, now available with Hyper-V. And if you want to write your own add-on, which can be used to, you know, capture a traffic or perform some tasks, you can do that effectively with this release as well over here. Now, uh, before I before I move from this, I want to show you last two demonstrations before we jump to the last part of the session. That is, in Windows Server 2012, one of the new features what we've done with Hyper-V is a feature called as live migration. Now, what is the meaning of live migration? So, I, I will go to my Hyper-V settings over here, and here I will enable a feature called as a live migration. Now, it means that I can completely migrate my virtual machine from one box to another box, directly having this direct attack storage on each of the box without needing of a shared storage or no SAN. This is possible with Windows Server 2012. So you can actually move the VMs between clusters or nodes without having to worry about the, the performance or without worrying the anything inside. So I will enable this on my both the nodes over here. So if I go to my host number 7, it is also having this Hyper-V configured over here. And I have this VM called as IS6 over here. So let me, let's say, try to sync this VM and see the status over here. So it's singing. And now let me do one thing. Let me right click and say move. This is how I will move my virtual machine to different node locally. And then I'll get an option. Do you want to move the VM or VM storage, which is the VHDX file? I will say that I want to move the VM. Now where do you want to move it? I will say I want to move it to host number 6. When I hit next, my hyper will check if the server really has that live migration enabled. It detects that and it gives me an option that, what do you want to do? Do you want to move the VM data to a single location or do you want to VM data to selecting to multiple locations such as the, some files into other locations, some files such as VHD into other locations. I will say that, move everything to the same file over there. And then I have to choose a folder, which is actually the folder that I have to choose on my remote machine, which is my VHD folder on my host number 6, I will say next, and I will say finish. And what eventually will happen is that it will actually start performing this live migration. So the way it works is that, first it copies the VHD file, then it starts copying the memory content along with the data, and in the end, the control is transferred to my host number 6, or whichever the node that I have in that case. All right, so once we have uh, done this, let me just let me minimize this. And I will just come back to my node number six. So we should be able to see that VM quickly over here in a few minutes. So if, if you see, I'm actually still thinking that VM of this machine as well. 
And why did I have the VM run? So I want to show you one more feature. You must have observed that then the VM called as Ubuntu 12 over here and uh, also Ubuntu 12 on my host number 7 over here on this machine as well, which is in a running state. So what I have done is we have a feature called as replication. So this is a disaster recovery feature available out of the box in an OS. What it will do is it will allow me to replicate certain VMs into my remote environment as the DR strategy. And here I need to enable this feature called as enable my enable this server as a replica server. And I can choose my HTTP or HTTPS based topic. I can use certificates as well to connect. And then I can provide this location where I have to replicate the VM. In order to replicate the VM, I just need to right click on the VM and say that I want to replicate. Now in this case, I'll just right click on the VM and say enable replication. I will say hit next. And then I will say that my replica server is zero. In this example, sorry, it's zero six, and I will say next. And it will actually ask me that which is the port you want to choose. I will choose HTTP port sixty. It will detect the VHD file, which is smart enough. It understands that I need to replicate a VM, and it will ask me how, how many recovery points do you want. So if you want to have multiple kind of snapshots, you can choose multiple recovery points, which will be using VSS, which is a volume shadow of a service. I will choose the default and in the end I can click on finish to configure my last piece that how do I want to transfer the entire VHD from this location to my DR site. Now of course the 5 GB will be too high for me to send it over a network. So I can export it to an external media and then copy it over the disk over there which could be the BitLocker encrypted disk. And on the remote location I will just copy the VHD and then you know start the replication with the help of the data being copied first and then the continuous replication of the data. I have done this for this VM and I can choose and see this particular replication health over here and I can do this plant failover or I can do the test failover and I can do many more things over here. So if I choose this replication health, it shows me this track over here. And if I just come back to my post number 6 over here, you will see that here is my VM site, this is my, my user to VM with all of those multiple snapshots. And I can just record back to any of the snapshots in case of my black site goes down. So that's the beauty of my replication. And here I can see all the status from my primary server, replica server, and many more details. And by the time we have completed that, our IS6 has completely moved and there is no refugee on the host number 7 and it's all on host number 6 over here. And I can still able to ping the machine and there is hardly any ping IS6. And here it is, I can ping this VM effectively without any problem. So that is some of, these are some of the enhancements that we have done with the help of this Windows Server 2012 in my virtualization based announcements as well. And at the same time, I can completely manage my complete Hyper-V. I just wanted to show you quickly this last important piece that I can completely manage my Hyper-V with the help of a PowerShell as well. So, if I have to find on this machine, I have this PowerShell, and if I have to find, let's say, a list of all the VMs, so I'll just use this command called as get hyphen VM, and it will show me all the VMs which are running right now. So I can kind of use this get command and use this wildcat character like star dash VM. It will give me there are certain commands available to perform certain tasks for VMs, just create VM, start VM, stop VM, new VM, and things like that. So this way, my entire server is completely modularized to make sure that I can completely integrate with my organization. So lastly, before we close off, there are some announcements we made in terms of Active Directory and security as well, such as these threat access announcements. We have some AD deployment announcements. I can deploy my AD with the help of a PowerShell. I can completely virtualize my Active Directory based announcements. We have multi-tenancy included with this release. We have classification rules implemented which works with the help of the file and classification infrastructure. And then there are many more things that we have added with this release of this server platform. So without, before I jump on to the questions, I would like to share some resources which are pretty much useful for you all. Uh, this is where you can actually download this uh, Windows Server 2012, System Internet 2012 Evaluation SP1. And if you want to find more about Windows Server, then you should actually register for this link called as microsoftvirtualacademy.com that's where you will find all the information uh, uh, about Windows Server and System Center. Again, 
I will be sharing this deck with you all, or you can visit my blog to find this information. So you find all of that uh, over here. So let me quickly update uh, that. And these are my credentials. That's my email address, aviraj at microsoft.com. That's my blog address, blog.techmail.com slash aviraj. And my Twitter handle is at the rate aviraj triple one. If you have any questions, feedback, or any good bad or whatever the queries that you have, feel free to reach out to me over an email, and I'll be more than happy to, you know, solve your problem. And before I now wrap up, I would like to take a few questions if you have any. So let me just open up the chat window over here. So do we have any questions that I can take? So, thank you so much, Aviraj. Thank yes. you, everyone. Uh, now, Q&A box at the header bar. Or you can raise your hands by clicking the uh, raise hand icon. You can get the